Hi, everyone. We'll give it a minute for people to join, and then I'll introduce Dr. Grimalt. Give it a little more time and then I'll introduce him. We're about halfway to our normal viewers. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with Dr. Grimalt's introductions. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ramon Grimalt, who's an MD, PhD. He is currently an associate professor of dermatology at the Universitat Internacional de Catalunya in Barcelona, Spain. Um, he has participated in more than 80 international congresses and he's also an organizer for many different um, societies, both locally and internationally. He serves on the review board for 10 scientific journals He's received numerous awards and scholarships to support his work. Um, and his main fields of interest are pediatric dermatology and trichotology, which he will talk about today during his talk. Um, Dr. Grimalt has written over 84, article, uh, 84 scientific articles with a total impact factor of 175,000 downloads and views. And he speaks English, French, Italian, Catalan, and Spanish, and is able to deliver uh, lectures in all of those languages, which is very impressive. So it's my pleasure to welcome you. And I'm going to share screen and we'll uh, share his recording. And then he'll be around, as you see, uh, for the live Q&A at the end. Let me just make sure I'm sharing my sound. Yep. Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here discussing some of the new aspects of how to use hair loss in children, being part of these global dermatological talks, which I'm proud and happy to be involved on. How to induce hair loss? Uh, it's a way of talking, and some people might come to you with this aspect, or others with these funny looking aspects. Or they would like to try to find this asymmetrical way of hairstyle. Others would have some sophisticated uh, haircuts or regarding to flight, you can have these nice images of auto induced hair loss. Or others will have these very sophisticated 3D aspects sharing haircuts with some paint on the scalp. And the most crazy one I've seen is this one that it's like a lizard on the scalp of the patient. So let's just start on our talk uh, discussing about terminology. What artificial hair loss, what self inflected hair loss, and what self induced hair loss? Well, this is the plan we shall cover in the next uh, 40 minutes. So we'll have a definition, clinical findings, we'll have a look to trichoscopy, and then we'll move into treatment. Trichotillomania, which is the most common of the diseases we'll be dealing today on, is no longer considered an impulse disorder. After DSM-5, it has been reclassified as an obsessive compulsive and related disorder. What are the clinical findings of trichotillomania? Most of you are very aware of them. So usually we are in front of females. The usual age is from four to 12 years and they show with artificially reduced hair density. Sometimes it's obvious difficult for the doctor to realize that this uh, hair that's not in there has been removed by the patient itself, because in most cases, patients will not state it. If you look careful to the scalp, you might see broken hairs. You have this negative pull test because all the hair that has been plucked 
all the telogen hairs have been pulled before, so the resting hairs are in antigen. So the pull test is always negative, and you might have some psychological conflicts on this patient suffer from lit. So you will find a mixture of hair. We call it a dirty aspect of the scalp with short, long, and mixture of hairs. Usually they choose an easy to reach zone. So most people would not pull hair from here, but they would pull it from here because it's more comfortable while you are at school or while you're watching TV, you pull your hair from the back of your scalp. Mostly commonly girls and the pull test, remember, is negative. This would be the classical aspect. We call it a dirty plaque because you have this mixture of broken hair. You might see some hemorrhages close to the scalp because of that. A child is not so common, but you might have it also in males. All the patients suffering from trichotillomania. These are three patients from uh, Dr. Rike Blume Petavi from the Charité in Berlin. But we have other words that start with trico, like trichotillomania, but also trichophagia with trichobezoa and the Rapunzel syndrome, trichotinomania, trichoteromania, trichorizophagia, tricholegiomania by proxy, and trichodagomania. We shall try to cover most of them. What's trichotinomania? Uh, in trichotillomania, people were pulling their hair. In trichotinomania, they cut their hair artificially and they come to you complaining of hair loss. Usually they are not so young uh, children, they are mostly adolescents from 13 to 18, and they have this artificially reduced hair density in well-defined areas. They have short hairs and they complain on hair loss. They come to you saying, I'm losing my hair, and you see these funny looking plaques of short hair on the scalp. You might find this abnormal cut hair with a totally normal trichogram because they do not pull the hair and they also have a lot of psychological conflicts. This would be a patient coming to you with this kind of problem. Another patient in this case is from also Ulrike Blumenbeterbeam. What's trichotelomania? If trichotiloids to pull, in trichotemnoids to cut, trichotiloids to rub. If you frenetically rub your hair, you might broke it and produce also areas of alopecia. So this is alopecia by rubbing. We usually have the same location of trichotilomania. It's more comfortable to rub here than to rub in here. The plaques are not so well limited and the difficult uh, therapy, it's the same for the both or three of the diseases we have covering. You see in these patients, the of trichotelomania, another funny looking plaque of trichotelomania. So trichotilo hair plaque, trichotemno hair cut, and trichotero hair is rubbed. Pierre Freischmuth Paul was the first one to publish this in the European Journal of Dermatology in 2001. Then the group of Ralph Tripp, uh, also from Switzerland, published the second case in 2003, trichotiromania. We have seen a patient with eyebrows trichotiromania, and we had uh, this cooperation with the psychiatrist on trying to manage the prognosis depending on how easy it's for the patient and how easy it's for the doctor to recognize the underlying, underlying mental disorder. This was a university professor that compulsively were rubbing the exterior part of the highlights having this type of aspect. Under the scanning electron microscope we performed, we could find this um, trichoptilosis, this open ends of the hair so characteristic. Let's uh, move into the origin of these words and we will introduce another one. In trichotillomania, tricks hair, the line to pull, and mania, it's excessive excitement. So someone, it's pulling the hair because is, she is or he is too excited. In trichophagia, 
you are eating your hair. So in most cases, you pull it and then you eat it, but not in all cases, you pull it first and then you eat it. In trichorhizophagia, you are eating selectively just the root of the hair. So these patients pull the hair, they put it on their mouth and they just eat the tip, the interior part of it. So eating your own root. Trichorhizophagia is eating the root of the hair and it comes from the Greek word riza, which means root. Uh, we had this patient that was uh, pulling the hair and he, she was saying that she was eating like eating sunflower seeds. She had the same feeling of putting the hair on the mouth and just clicking the end of it. And we have published this uh, with Professor Grudy Hapler uh, some years ago. What's a trichobizoa? A trichobizoa is what is when you eat a lot of hair and your digestive tract is not able to properly digest it. So it remains stuck inside of your stomach. Uh, the term Rapunzel syndrome has been used to report when the, this trichobizoa is extending like a tail through the intestine. So the idea of Rapunzel princess that uh, was um, hanging all the hair from the window in order that the beloved could climb at night to see her on her chamber. This is the idea of the Rapunzel syndrome. If your hair is long like that and you're eating your own hair, you might have a trichobizoa and a Rapunzel syndrome. I had some patients with this amazing long anagen face that have this very long hair. This is probably six or seven years old on the amount. I mean, six or seven anagen face years long. Let's have a look to some papers regarding that. This was a fairy tale with a hairy tail. It was a 21 year old pregnant female. She was at the 20, 33 weeks of gestation and she was suffering from bipolar disorder. And she was referred for a local uh, management of abdominal pain to the local hospital. So she was pregnant, abdominal pain. So no one thought of anything related to dermatology, obviously. And they finally found that she has this enormous uh, bezoa inside of her stomach. The term bezoa is derived from the Arabic word badza, which is, means an antidote. So the bezoas originating in the digestive tracts of animals, they were used originally as an antidote against plaque, snake bats, leprosy, or even epilepsy. Have a look to this article in 2018. They were removing an extremely big bezoa. If the hair of the patient is long, obviously the possibility of developing a bizarre or a Rapunzel syndrome, it's much bigger. This is another case report uh, for a large type of bizarre. You can see here how the bizarre was standing and you can see the itsmus, the, the, the ending of the stomach and the starting of the medium bowel to see how was this related. It's amazing to see how different approaches uh, have been taken in order to treat trichobizoas. And they found in this article that uh, depending on the type of bizarre, Coca-Cola irrigation could be used in the idea of fragmentation of it. So they used in this paper in 2016, Coca-Cola introduced via nasogastric to a direct injection and also with a spray through the endoscopy. And they were also trying to see the dissolubility of the bezoar in vitro. So they divided the bezoar in four parts and incubated it with Coca-Cola, with Sprite, with soda water and with distilled water. And they were changing the solution every 12 hours each bezoa fragment was incubated for seven days 
they were measuring the weight the density and the form, but they found no changes in any item after one week of performing all these changes. So this idea that Coca-Cola might help on solving the trichobezoas is not so clear. But all the papers have been on that. And this one was also very interesting in 2013. Coca-Cola can effectively dissolve gastric fetobezoas, not trichobezoas, as a first-line treatment. And also the, the one on the on the bottom, in vitro analysis of gastric fetobezoa dissolved by Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola zero cellulase and papain. They were saying if other type of products may help or induce this solubility of the bezoas. Well, it's amazing when you go to the literature, sometimes you find so strange papers. What's trichodaganomania? What a strange word. This I just mentioned before that some people eat the hair after pulling it, but some people are biting directly their hair without pulling it. And it's, it's called trichodaganomania, eating your own hair or biting your own hair. This was published in the Blue Journal in 2009. And you can also have trichodactomania by proxy when you bite someone else here. This can be seen in animals quite commonly, but no so commonly in humans. I have at home a small dog. You can see it on the left bottom. It's a Vizsla. And I also have a cat. You can see it on the right top. She's called Perla. She's a street cat. And I did perform an experiment. And I published that uh, last year. I was putting some uh, attractive uh, Honk material on both of my forearms, and in one I had the dog licking at it, and on the other one I had my cat licking at it. And I could observe that a small amount of epilation was produced by the cat, and no epilation was produced by the dog because the cat's tongue is much rougher. I had to spend a long time doing that. I was sitting on the sofa just preparing my talk with a cat on the side and my dog on the other side. And we call that tricholichomania by proxy when you get some epilation by licking something. Human tongues are not capable of provoking this type of problem. Let's move to the third part of my talk. And let's discuss a little bit about trichoscopy. Well, everyone now uses a trichoscope in dermatology. And for some of you listening to this talk, you are not dermatologists or you still do not have a dermatoscope, I really would like to advise you to get one. Dermatoscopes, there are so many types. If you are a pediatrician, you can use the, sear, the same ear um, plug a style from Heinze to get it, or you can use it directly from a handy scope on your mobile phone. They are very cheap USB trichoscopes like this one, it's about $25, or others extremely expensive like this one, which is $1,200,000. You can get very cheap down on the internet, so do not hesitate on getting a trichoscope because. With dermoscope or trichoscope, you can have so many uses, not only for trichoscopy, but also on dermatological uses. It's extremely useful for studying nevi or from differentiating nevi from melanoma, also from pigmented to vascular lesions, angioma and vascular malformations. For many tumors, there are some characteristical aspects, also for nail diseases, also for hair indeed, and also, if you're getting old and you don't see properly your patients with the dermatoscope, you can see them much better. And if you want to brag a little bit, and if you are in your private office, even if you have made your diagnosis of basal cell carcinoma, if you use the dermatoscope, the patients will be more convinced that you are sure about what you have seen. So should I buy a dermatoscope? I really believe you should. 
and I will now show how useful it is for this type of problems we were discussing. Here's extremely nice atlas of tricoscopy from the group of uh, the Poland group of Lydia Hudnika. And they have described so many signs on trichotildomania that might help you mostly on the differential diagnosis of alopecia areata because the cases that are very clear, you don't have any doubt and you don't need a dermatoscope, but those cases, they are sometimes a little bit tricky and the plaque is not well defined, but it's not so dirty and the patient has no the exact conflicts you are looking for and it's not the same location and it's not a girl. Sometimes it's not so easy. So this paper from the group of Lydia Rydnika, they described all these signs and I really would like you to read it if you're interested in it because you will really uh, get some information when you are in front of difficult cases and you don't know exactly what the diagnosis you are looking at. So they say that you should look for broken hairs coiled hairs, flame hairs, V-sign, the tulip hair, and the hair powder. Have a look to some of these aspects. And you can see in the first image, this broken hair, on the second one on the B, the coiled hair, the hair is turned onto itself. The flame hair, it looks that the hair is going up like that. The V-sign, like an open hair, uh, trichoptilosis. The tulip here, it has hair that's open uh, like a bulb, uh, very nice, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, tulips, uh, and the hair powder. We said before that the plaques on the scalp of the patient suffering from trichotillomania, they look dirty, they look powdery, they look a little bit of dusty. And this is called the hair powder from some authors, and this uh, might help on the differential diagnosis, mostly of alopecia areata, in which the plaques usually are more clean, more yellow in style. We also publish in the World Journal of Dermatology with my colleague, uh, Dr. Moreno, uh, trichoscopy essentials for the dermatology. So if you are interested, I'll be happy to send a copy of this PDF to you. In the International Journal of Trichology in 2014, some authors, also published uh, these uh, uh, diagnostic tools and they published this uh, dirty aspect, the hair powder. Once again, have a look at this very nice image. I would say don't look at the arrows. They are important and they show the tulip here. But look at the dirty aspect of the scalp. The scalp does not look clean. And this is small dirt on the scalp is meaning that the small hemorrhages have been performed by pulling the hair, new hair, it's growing in some areas. And this is the aspect of the scalp that has been traumatized by the constant pulling on the hair. In some cases, the dirt aspect, it's also associated with some small hemorrhages, like you can see in here, and with also trichoptilosis. The trichoptilosis is the open ends of the hair by traction or friction. It's more typical of friction. Here you can see the flame hairs and the black dots, quite characteristic. Black dots are also seen in all the problems. So you don't have to take one of these signs alone as a diagnostic tool, because obviously this will be an error. You can use the black dots if they are mixed with other type of signs. We published together of, uh, with my colleague, uh, Mario Cutrone in 2017, uh, a, a peculiar case of the plaque out sign for trichotillomania. It was trichotillomania on the bird. This was the, the patient. He was an adolescent and he was complaining of this eruption on the face. And uh, we were looking at him and we were thinking, what's going on in here? There's something very strange. And this young adolescent had a problem that he was the first one at school to grow his beard. And he was not happy with that because his friends were still uh, 
child looking and he was with this big beard so he spent hours in front of the mirror with the forces of her mother she uses for for the eyebrows just pulling the hair of the face in order that no one could see that he was growing a beard and we described this sign of this is a very well located hemorrhages in this patient that it was really a challenge to make the diagnosis because he was not really providing any information some authors from india also published uh, this uh, eye hair a prognostic marker in alopecia areata and trichotillomania it's interesting to see uh, they describe this uh, eye hair with this uh, way of looking at the black dot. In fact, it's a modified uh, eye dot. So this uh, black dot grows into a normal hair, and this resembles a little bit the letter I. I would say that in some cases this is really useful. In other cases, it's not so easy to look at that. Let's move into some differential diagnosis. Uh, alopecia areata is the most difficult differential diagnosis of psychotibomania, but also barbershop alopecia, septic nose of the scalp, and bubble hair. In alopecia areata, usually you have a clean plaque. So remember this idea of dirty plaque versus clean plaque. The alopecia areata is mostly well defined, and in trachotillomania patients are not so well precisely defining the area they are pulling. The pull test in alopecia areata, if it is active, it's positive. You remove easily the damage here. In trichotillomania, it's always negative. If you perform a trichogram, there are no telogens in trichotillomania. And in alopecia areata, you see the ill looking hair. We call it dystrophic hair. The sex on the age is not so different. And psychological alterations in alopecia areata, uh, some authors believe they exist, some others believe it does not exist, but in trichotillomania they are always there. Alopecia areata has not a special location, and trichotillomania has a very special location, and most patients, as we have already mentioned, choose the same area because it's more comfortable to go and pluck your hair from there. What is what we call the barbershop alopecia? And some stylist in the world may be able to show this so beautiful results as you can see in here, but we call barbershop alopecia when physical or chemical injuries have been applied to the scalp and they provoke the hair break at all the same level. This is typical of curly hair. If you have black and curly hair, and if you want to have it yellow and straight, you have to perform a lot of chemical action in order to get your hair looking yellow and uh, not curly, but laces. And there's no need of treatment if you make diagnosis. So many people complain of hair loss after going to the saloon, but in fact, if you don't get this type of chemical damage, you never get hair loss after going to the barbershop. Have a look to this diagram I've, uh, I've made for you. In alopecia areata, you have this typical exclamation mark points. In trichotillomania, you have this different uh, length of the hair because some have, were pulled today and some were pulled one week ago, and in barbershop alopecia, all the hair are exactly broken at the same level. So you could tell, looking at that and measuring the millimeters, what was the day exactly that the patient went to the barbershop to get this hairstyle done. That was not well, so it did not proceed so well. What are the alopecic and septic nodules of the scalp. This is the aspect of that. It looks like a, a plaque of alopecia areata, but you can feel it. It's a little bit bumpy. So it the feeling, uh, looking at it, it's alopecia areata. But when you put your hand on it, 
you don't find the flat aspect or the depressed aspect of the Lupicia reata, and you can see something that's fluctuating in it. This um, was studied in some papers, and they, this paper, they show 15 cases, clinical pathologically, of alopecic and septic nodules of the scalp. And also in this one, they discuss about the pseudocyst of the scalp. So do we have two different entities, pseudocyst of the scalp and the alopecic nodules of the scalp? Mm, it's uh, difficult to tell, but uh, we published this paper in 2016, uh, and we state from this paper that alopecic and aseptic nodules of the scalp or pseudocysts of the scalp, we believe they are exactly the same entity, but they well described a little bit from different aspects. One were more histopathologically and the other was more clinically. So that was the reason that they believed they were two different entities, but in fact, they are the same. The last differential diagnosis is bubble hair. In bubble hair, you find these localized plaques of alopecia, mostly on the frontal vision. And this is because some people apply the hair dryer directly to the scalp after getting out from the shower. And they try to do it to get a peculiar hairstyle. But if you get too much heat too close to your scalp, when your hair is still damp of water, full of water, you might have the water boiling inside of your head and you get these very nice images under the scanning electron microscope, but you get some alopecic plaques on the air. So this is the aspect of the bubble hair under the optical microscope. You see bubbles inside of the hair and under the scanning electron microscope, you see the swollen hair, the medulla cortex, cortical dilatation, and the Gruyere cheese images, it is fissures and holes on the hair surface, have a nice look at the aspect under the scanning electron microscope. What's the treatment of the bubble hair? Well, avoid to apply directly the heat of the hair dryer to your scalp, apply before the towel, and then you won't have this problem. Let's move to the last part of my talk and let's discuss a little bit about treatment. N-acetylcysteine appeared some years ago and all the dermatologists in the world that we were treating patients with uh, alopecia reata, trichotillomania and so on, we all jumped into that because it was a, a cheap treatment. It was a non-dangerous treatment. It was easy to get it because pediatricians use it quite commonly. So we all started using this treatment for trichotillomania. Because of this paper, they showed this 12-week double-blind placebo control study with high doses of N-acetylcysteine, 1,200 or up to 2,400 versus placebo. And they showed big differences with a significant improvement after nine weeks with any adverse effect. But then it was there's a scoping review of the old published papers. And in 2017, they reviewed 14 articles related to an N-acetylcysteine and the results. And they found that only one was well-performed placebo controlled trial. And they found in this article, there were no significant difference in the reduction of hair pulling be between the N-acetylcysteine and the placebo groups. So what, what, what's the point of, of that? What's the, what is this going? Well, I have to admit that I used N-acetylcysteine in some patients and they did also improve. And I believe that uh, when doctors we are convinced of something and we are giving something to a patient that has a problem related to his or her emotions. Your emotion on the way you give it might have a positive effect on the patient. So if you are so convinced of that, you might convince your patient and they might stop pulling because they believe this will help them on doing that. So I, I do believe that in some patients I treated, 
the drug was useful, but I understand that it's not the drug itself, but it's the way we were all convinced about how the drug was working, that everyone was using it in a positive way, and some of the patients just improved because of that. This is a, a, an interesting paper we published in 2015 together with a, our professor from the Netherlands, Arnold Ranya, that unfortunately he passed away with a cardiac arrest about five years ago. And in this article, we discussed a method that it's called the Kipling method, and also it's called the five W's and one H. It's a way of approaching to a problems by a systematic uh, view. And they utilize this set of questions whose answers are considered basing in information gathering. Atomoxetin, it has been also used uh, on trichotillomania. It's a selective inhibitor of a neuropinephrine. And it's a first new, new psychostimulant agent approved by the Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And this 13 year old boy responded dramatically to this drug. These are uh, images from this paper with atomoxetin. And with this last uh, slide, I would like to thank you all for all your time. And here you can see some of our colleagues. This is Mario Cutrone and Dirk van Giesel. In the back, you can see Talia Kakkoro and also Barbara Kunz. In the end, some other colleagues are on a pediatric dermatology meeting. And I would like to invite you all to join us in Barcelona, in Sitges precisely. It's a very beautiful small village close to Barcelona. Next year, we are organizing a big hair meeting in there. We had the chance to organize the world meeting three years ago in Sitges in the exactly same location. And every participant was so happy and excited about it. So we we'll decided to give some continuity to that meeting. Unfortunately, we have the pandemic in between. So we had postponed the meeting. And now the definitive date will be the last week of September and the first week of October of 2022. So if you'd like to join us, just follow the website. Uh, just put your name on there and you'll receive updates and information about the meeting. And with that, I like to close my talk and I'll be happy to answer the questions you have for me. And it was a really my pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye. It was a wonderful talk. I learned so much. Um, let's see what we have for questions in the chat. Okay, so um, Bill is asking, uh, when do you suspect trichophagia or bezoar? Do patients usually offer that they are consuming or are there specific questions that you ask to elicit this? And what is the workup if it is suspected? Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is a nice and, and difficult question to answer. I would say that um, most of these patients, they always have been always um, finding on the surgical operation and sometimes it's an acute abdomen or sometimes like this lady I showed to you from that paper, it was a pregnancy. So usually it's not the finding that you suspect but it's something you realize afterwards, unfortunately. I don't think it's in a specific um, way of approaching it, but that uh, last paper I showed to you uh, with Arnold Oranya, the um, clipping method with the five W's, a little bit, it's the same that some psychiatrists use for detecting sexual abuse, that uh, many people are so scared of confessing the situation. Um, this is not the same dramatic situation, obviously, as sexual abuse, but the type of approach of systematic question to specific answers sometimes allows you a little bit to better get close to the patient, 
and some of them at the end, if you get close enough, they will confess that in fact they were trying to attract your attention or they are trying to provoke a situation at home in order that they take care of them. I think most of these adolescents, I just they are just trying to ask for help and they don't know how to do it. And the way they do it, it's just acting like they are ill, so they take care of them and they bring them to the to the doctor. It's a little bit like these children that they they don't they say, I don't want to eat when they sit at the table. If they eat, parents say nothing to them. But if they say, I don't want to eat, parents both are over the child saying, Well, you should eat, you should eat. Yeah. So if you have a sibling and he's eating and you're not, parents will be with you the whole time. So they, they realize that sometimes a way for acting and receiving attention is as easy as having a, a, a problem. But it's complicated, I fully agree. Yes, I completely agree. It would be very complicated. But I just, I love how you handle your patients, how well you, you know, strive to, you know, approach it, basically approach it from a position of love where you're, you're caring for your patients and you're establishing this trust um, to get them to open up to you. I really, I really love that. Um, Bill has a follow-up question. I'm also wondering about the role of scalp biopsy in your opinion. You showed many helpful clinical features to establish diagnosis. Do you find that a biopsy is usually not necessary? Or I would even follow, do you think the biopsy would help you know, the patient, like establish like, okay, yes, this doctor is actually taking an action um, to biopsy me and, and diagnose me? Yes, I would say that uh, in most cases, we do not need a scalp biopsy to arrive to a proper diagnosis. In most cases, you don't need it. And I think uh, that performing a scalp biopsy on a child or an adolescent, uh, if I don't suspect something very serious, usually I don't do it. It's bloody, it's a, a mess, it's complicated. I, I think uh, it's, um, it's not a, a normal approach. And I agree if I agree with you in between lines properly that sometimes it might help parents believe that you know a lot what's going on. And sometimes uh, the type of approach that you do more scientifically or more aggressive or getting more inside of the patient, some of them might open their minds if they, if they see you with, with the skull. But um, I, I don't think we need it for diagnostic purposes, but it could be maybe a strategy to get the patient more talkative, but I've never used that system, but it's, a, it's maybe a way of doing it. Makes total sense. Um, I'm actually curious, like, do you have um, people referring patients to you from like a large uh, catchment area because you offer like psych derm services? Yeah, I, I, I am, unfortunately, because alopecia and trichotillomania are not easy to treat. Unfortunately, I see plenty of them. Um, so at the end, you you know how to deal a little bit with them. But um, well, we all dermatologists know that there are so many diseases that are difficult to, to treat. And trichotillomania and alopecia areata, uh, they are both difficult. I remember one one talk from a colleague from Paris and in, in France, and they, they offer this way of approach. It's called the liaison clinic in which you ask the patient to come next Monday and they will have in front of them a specialist for their problem. And you are not stating who the specialist will be and what the problem is. And then inside of the dermatological consultation, you have a psychiatrist sitting on your chair and the patient gets a total different approach by this liaison clinic. It makes the, the contact clinic. So I think it's a, an elegant way of referring patients to the psychiatrist. And at least in Europe, maybe America, you are more open. But in Europe, there's this a stigma of the psychiatrist. I don't want to see a psychiatrist because I'm not mad. So how dare you send my child to a psychiatrist? He's not crazy. Um, so this liaison clinic 
really it's helpful. Um, I, I see that in big hospitals, in big centers, it's a nice approach if interdepartmental bosses <laughs> are able to, to get in touch with, with each other because money is always a problem who's paying the visit and who's visiting in my in my chair no? but i think it's it's not a crazy idea referring these patients to a psychiatrist it's not easy and most of them will not accept that yes i think that's probably true in many countries um so it's something we have to work towards right breaking down that stigma um, speaking of which, I have some students who are actually very interested in potentially pursuing um, psych derm as a specialty. I was curious if you have any advice for them as medical students and future uh, dermatologists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Well, there's a there's a European Society of uh, Psychosomatic Medicine, and we also have in Spain a local society for psychodermatology. And I would say that many dermatological conditions, many, maybe nearly all of them, are related somehow to emotions. Many diseases are triggered by emotions. Others that are visible change your emotions because you see them, and others are directly related to your um, mood. So if you are a good psychodermatologist or you are a dermatologist with some knowledge of psychodrugs, and some knowledge of how to approach this patient, you will be a better dermatologist because you will be able to take care. If you have a patient with psoriasis, that it's full of psoriasis, and you help him with a biologist, uh, with a biological, and with some drugs during the flood period, maybe he will feel better. And our job as doctors is helping our patients feeling better or if you have a very severe acne, or you have a patient with a big angioma on the face, if you help them also emotionally, I think you will be a better doctor because they will feel better. It does not mean that I will not use uh, isotretinoin for an acne, or I would not use propanolol for an angioma, but you can do both things at the same time, and some of them will receive a psychodrug transiently, and others just psychotherapy. So I think you will be indeed better dermatologist and more complete dermatologist if you are not scared of using psychotherapies and if you have a little bit of knowledge of a psychotherapy. I am totally convinced about that. Yes, I love that whole patient approach. Um, I'm also curious if you have any hypotheses as to using the biologics or the anti-inflammatories, do they ultimately impact the mental health um, by themselves? Or do you think that it's really imperative to incorporate like a psychoactive drug or, or um, a therapy type approach? I don't know. I'm not, uh, I'm not able to, to answer. What do you think? Tell me your opinion. Well, I guess I'm kind of fishing because I'm interested in neuroimmunology. Um, as an immunologist, it's, it's a new uh, growing field that I think is really interesting. And I think um, there's been some work at least showing that sensory neurons can respond to cytokines. We had one of our other Global Derm Talks uh, speakers, Dr. Brian Kim, talk about how itch can be uh, you know, perpetuated by this immune neuro uh, feedback loop. And so I'm just kind of curious, like, if you think that's present in all of these patients too, um, you know, if there's actually some low-grade um, inflammation that, that may be even contributing to their to their psych derm conditions. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Well, I think we're running out of questions, um, but this was a wonderful talk. As I mentioned, I learned so much. I really don't have so much about the field at all. And I'm so grateful because I, I have three trainees who really want to become um, psych, psychodermatologists. Um, so I'm sure they will absolutely love this talk. And you're definitely inspiring the next uh, generation of, of uh, dermatologists and, and psychiatrists. So, um, And Bill says, thanks so much for a great and interesting talk. I know he's unable to unmute himself right now. Um, but we really enjoyed it. And we're so grateful to have you here. Um, and thanks to our audience members who are able to uh, tune in live and we will be posting this on YouTube. And we have another speaker actually next week, um, Dr. Michael Rosenblum, who will discuss regulatory T cells in the skin. So thanks everybody, have a wonderful day.
Thank you very much. Goodbye. Take care. Bye bye.